Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Random Heathen Ramblings podcast, where we discuss all sorts of things Germanic heathenry related. My name is Jesse. I am your host. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, uh, sorry for the new look um, that you've got with me for right now as my one of my items dropped. But anyway, uh, I, I had an intro recorded before we get into the episode today. Uh, for those of you that are watching, I always have like an intro before I bring my guests on. And um, there was like eight minutes of that video that I shot that has no audio. Um, so unless you're really good at reading lips and uh, I'm not good at transcribing anything uh, from what I had said for eight minutes, uh, that file is gone. <laughs> um, so you've got this, and this is going to be way shorter than um, what I mentioned before or, or in the in the previous recording that didn't record any audio. Um, but we got Papa Olufsen coming on here today from Fjallvatir, and uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, the history within heathenry and just history in general, because uh, there's there was a question or not a question, but a, a topic suggestion that got raised um, by somebody. And we're going to be talking about history, the, the misrepresentation or the falsification or the altering of history. It's been a really fun conversation uh, with Papa this week. Um, so before we get into it, please be sure to check the description and show notes for not just all the ways that you can um, support the channel and the podcast here through Linktree. There's literally dozens, well, I mean, not dozens, but a, but there's a bunch of links in there. I just recently added my Amazon wish list. If you guys are so inclined and you want to send me something, it's down there. Now add it to the Linktree link. But you got all the socials that you can follow. You can become a patron on Patreon. Speaking of which, I just added a new tier to my Patreon page. So if you want to join at the Scald level, which is like the second to highest uh, level in my Patreon uh, tiers, you one of the benefits that you get is not just all the previous benefits of lower tiers, but you get a once a month hour long Zoom session with me um, to go over things related to heathenry. You're free to ask me questions, pick my brain, uh, just general, more or less like a, a more personal dialogue that can take place over what's done on the podcast. Um, and so you can do it on a month to month basis. You're not obligated to do this every month consecutively, um, but you do need to be sure that if you want to be on uh, the following month's uh, schedule that you sign up for that the previous month. So for example, my first lesson or class or, or, or meeting or whatever you want to call it, my first session over Zoom is going to happen in July um, and the uh, enrollment uh, ends on the 1st of July. So you need to get in now or before the beginning of July. Um, to get in for next month and then every month thereafter. So for you know, August, you'd want to be sure to sign up for it um, before the first of that month and on and on and on. Um, but definitely check out the link in the description, the link tree link. It'll, you can follow the page uh, or the link to the Patreon page there. Um, some other things that have been going on, you know, we've got Sunablo coming up with Raven Moonhearth. We've got the Flurithy Folk Potluck uh, thing that's coming up the weekend after that, actually. Um, you know, Suna Bloat is coming up just this weekend, so we'll be there for that. My wife and I, uh, some of my tribe will be there at, up there in Springfield, Tennessee. And then the Hlurithy Folk Potluck uh, Park Moot will be um, at the end of this month, and that'll be in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Again, all those details will be linked in the description and show notes. Be sure to check them all out. Uh, once again, sorry for the less than stellar video presentation, but I already took down my studio setup. Um, and was going into post edit and realized, oh no, all the audio is gone. So you got this. Be sure to check all the links down below. Um, and let's hear a little bit of what Papa Olison does with his drums in the next segment. And then we're going to welcome him into the podcast. Hope you guys enjoy. Thank you so much. All 
right, folks. Well, we've got Papa Olison back here. Um, Fjallvatir is so Fjallvatir workshop is the is the is the business side of things. But I've heard you mention Papa before. Uh, Fjallvatir mountain shamanism uh, is it all? It's all one and the same, essentially, right? Um, it's all one and the same, as in it's right here, and it's uh, right here for me. Uh, Fjallvatir workshop is the craft side of things where we do the drums and runes and rattles and spiritual tools and wares. And then Fjallvatir Mountain Spirit Shamanism, it's uh, set up right now as an LLC, but that's where we do some of the um, spiritual workshops and you know, drum circle sessions and different aspects of spirituality, exploring practices, techniques, and methods. So the the uh, the classroom or the or the field work applying the the tools that you that you craft essentially yeah so uh, you're all part of it I mean I, I mentioned um, to the folks here on in, in in the intro you know you're no stranger to the podcast um, no. you've been a return guest multiple times you know dear friend of mine a brother of mine one of the, one of the few who I've just, you know, share that title with, and it's a great honor to have you back here. So thanks for taking the time to, to come and wrap with me a bit about this topic today. It's Absolutely. To have you back. Uh, it's an honor to be back. But uh, before we do get into it, I'm just curious, um, what, what, what are some things that you have going on, maybe uh, public wise, like you got, I, I know you've been, you've been vending at some local like Viking festivals and, and whatnot that have surfaced in the area. Is there anything else coming up here soon where you're going to be in person with your where, with your wares and, and other items in the area? There are a few that we're talking about. We just finished up the um, medieval fest uh, that happened here in North Wilkesboro. Um, it was a huge, huge uh, mead event, the North Carolina Mead Alliance, I think. I've got that right. But over nine master uh, mead makers and craftspeople uh, brought that delicious uh, nectar of the gods out uh, to share with the public. And so that was a fantastic event. Um, as far as going out publicly with the, the drums and things that I make here, I believe our next one is going to be the Wood Fire and Smoke Festival that's happening in Lenore, North Carolina, um, a little bit later on into the summer season. We're gonna take a little bit of time off um, from public events in uh, what we take to sell for the summer um, to host a few workshops, um, drum building workshops, rattle workshops here uh, at, the, at the spot at the actual Fjallvatir workshop. Nice. Is there, um, if people are listening and watching and they wanna get out on the workshop, type things is that uh where can they find that we will have that posted up on the social media page it'll come available also on the website uh, we're still yet to set the dates for those um, working through some of the materials now making sure that i've got enough materials before offering sign up to people so that way i know what sort of um, capacity what number we're going to cap it at for each workshop but we should have those dates up and made public within the next couple of weeks. And then from there, you'll be able to um, sign up on the website. But all that will be on our social media, uh, the Facebook page, Instagram. Sweet. Yeah, and I'll be, uh, I'll be linking all of your socials and your, and your website in the show notes and description areas for the viewers and whatnot to, to catch. So if everybody's in the area or is willing to uh, maybe make a a road trip for it. I can I can personally attest that you know time spent with uh, with Papa and the material that he is is so good at crafting, plus the knowledge and and just the experience of it all. Sharing in that that moment is is definitely worth it. So definitely follow along on their social medias, and if you're not on social media, just check back on their website um, for when those things get posted, and then definitely do check it out and support them because. Uh, it's a it's a great experience overall. I feel I'm not done the workshop part of it, but I've worked with you in in some other capacities, right? Like we've we've definitely shared those those moments together. So 
definitely encourage people well, to check out. We've done a few of the workshops here in the past, not hosted here at Fialbatier Workshop, which is uh, my residence, but in the area. Uh, people will come up and, you know, make the most of it or make the weekend of it, even though the workshop is a one day or a one hour, hour and a half type thing. We're in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Appalachia, and there's just so much to do and take in here if you are looking for experiencing the beauty of nature also. Uh, the trails, the mountains, the waterfalls, just all of it. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic place to be. Yeah, fully agree. You know, and, and for those that aren't in the area, we, they, they get to live vicariously through you, I guess, because you, you share so much on your social media to, you know, open the, the, the eyes, open that part of the world, you know, into people's homes. And it's, 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 it's a great thing. I think it's inspiring in a lot of ways. It's um, more than anything, an effort to share the truth of Appalachia. Um, over the course of its history, it's gotten such a bad reputation. It's been demoralized and um, made fun of in so many different ways, uh, whether it be the dialect or and the, the standard or state of living, but uh, many of those things aren't true, as you can see through uh, what I share of the real Appalachia. Yeah, that's a great, uh, that's a great segue, I would say. You mentioned Appalachia getting a bad rap or, or because of history and what happens to be the topic of the podcast this week, but that of uh, history and how it has um, really, in in some ways, been either mis mistranslated or or altered. And and this question or this this topic, in, you know, was was something shared by um, someone that I think you know. But it's old wolf music, and and up here on the screen, you guys that are watching are going to see the question that they posted. And it's uh, something that you know you Papa in, in in your various platforms have have shared thoughts on multiple times yourself but the question or the mention thing was um they feel like it would be highly beneficial or hugely beneficial to the greater community uh talking about how and where the old lore so we're talking like maybe uh something more on the, on the heathen side of things but how lore and, and history has either been mistranslated or purposely altered uh over time and you kind of alluded to that in your own backyard right that the Appalachia area where you're where you've settled down and, and where you're from so um what what type of things would you maybe start off with saying in, in Appalachia that have like you mentioned language and whatnot but what do you think some things historically or or whatnot that have been mis mis, mis uh misrepresented or altered purposely maybe um first and foremost the people the people of Appalachia um, you started off with the indigenous population here, which in this part of the Blue Ridge in Appalachia were the Cherokee. And then we had all the Scots Irish settlers to come over during the, the settlement period, the colonial days. And most of the land in North Carolina and the coastal lands were uh, taken up by the early settlers. Uh, they were already spoken for. It's right as soon as you get off the boat, it's by the water. Your trade is there back and forth um, to England or to to Denmark or wherever um, you're coming over from. So the Scots Irish didn't have the opportunity. They didn't have the wealth, the same money um, to purchase land there at that most convenient level. And they were pushed further toward the mountains. And the city folk that were coming over from London, England, or uh, wherever the the uppity people, they didn't want to uh, live that rough lifestyle, that frontier type lifestyle where you're uh, fully reliant on yourself to survive. Um, they needed their shops and their stores and um, to be able to go and purchase their goods rather than uh, take care for themselves. But some of those other people were more than accustomed to that, ready for that, and so settled here in the Appalachian Mountains. Most of the bad reputation came around um, during the, the height of the revolutionary period or the industrial revolution, I should say. It was purposely demoralized by those corporations and companies because of the natural resources in Appalachia. Coal is a big one. 
nickel, gold, silver, uh, the lumber, the timber, so many natural resources here that were ripe for the picking and nobody had accessed them before or were able to exploit those resources. So in order to get these things at the lowest cost to the companies, you demoralize the land, you make it cheap and you make it cheap by making the people cheap. Yeah, I was talking with somebody uh, on a, I was a guest on another podcast uh, just this past week. It was the Greyhorn Pagans podcast. And that podcast is hosted by a gentleman um, out of the Netherlands. So the podcast kind of just went different ways, much like ours does here um, randomly, so to speak. But um, it, we, we ended up sitting and talking a bit about colonization and and uh the area where i'm from in the northeast you know it was settled by the dutch which and, and he's dutch you know so there was like a commonality we, we got to speaking about um how the you know the colonizers or or you know people from across the pond you know they they, they came over and um in some ways you know lived side by side with the indigenous people that were that were here and learn things of of uh of value but like you're saying most of the the people who came over here early like i'm talking like the mayflower you know that that mass migration didn't come from from the netherlands because it's such a small country you know if they all migrated then there wouldn't be the netherlands as we know it now really they you know they would have they would have all come over but it was the rich people mm -hmm. you were talking about like uppity folks from the cities and stuff it was the people who had the money had the, the 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 finances to be able to buy their way through things instead of and they needed to, they needed to prolong that wealth and natural resources in europe at the time were depleting they had been running through them for thousands of years so now this new world has been discovered and that's new resources. Okay, we're almost tapped out of gold here in Spain, but this guy says that he just found some place across the ocean where they've got it flowing through the rivers and could care less. Mm -hmm. So let's go get that. Um, it was never really so much a mission of exploration for the, for the good of humankind to let's explore our globe, our planet, let's map it out. And that way we can connect and um, practice trade better. It was grabs for resources, grabs for land and um, wealth. It was acquisition. Exploitation versus exploration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one of the other things that came up on that, and uh, it, it probably rings true, was like, we, we talked about like the Mayflower, you know, the, you read about it in schools. Like it's one of those major history things that you learn about but one of the things you know talking about how history is misrepresented or, or altered is you know you don't hear so much about who actually was came over in the school books they, they they say it was the english that 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 came over it was a lot of dutch it was a lot of scottish and irish like you're uh saying so even to that that point of history you know which relatively speaking world history i mean we're less than a thousand years you know what, six seven hundred years ago it, you know, roughly tops when when all that happened. And now and today that history has been reworded or, or written to not even accurately convey who got over here, who came over here with that with that migration period, you know? It's uh, still on the textbook. So some um, very pleasant story about exploration. Uh, yeah. And it keeps everybody calm and uh, gives you a sense of, of pride. Well, that's, that's where I came from. And uh, th these are all good things. Yeah, and forget the all, fact that the there was all this genocide and all these other real terrible things that happened. Let's, let's keep it nice and, and pleasant, like you said. Right? And that's, it's exactly what the topic is tonight. We've got all these um, stories and books and the literature uh, that's provided and taught in our public schools and, and um, you think if anything, surely I can count on a history book. Surely I can count on a history teacher. But that history teacher learned from that history book and on back 
to the beginning when that particular version of history was written and it was written for a reason. It's to keep that calm and quiet. Um, nobody's gonna be proud to know how it actually happened. Um, lots you, of shameful things. Right. You know, and uh, what do you think about how history is written um, with, with bias? You feel like there's, there's bias included even in history, in the history books, historical texts, sources, from wherever. I mean, we, we'll, we'll move into like the Germanic stuff, the Norse stuff, but. Yeah, 100% absolutely do. And all around the world. And it's not just a, a Christian thing. It's not just a pagan thing. It's not just an American thing. It's um, this is something that has happened throughout history, by history, since the dawn of history. Um, the victor writes history. History remembers kings. You, know, you <laughs> write it how you want it to be remembered, whether that's how it actually happened or not. Um, mm. The pen is mightier than the sword, and if you wield both, you know you win that battle. You get to write it however you want. You've got a monopoly, pretty much. You've just you've just uh, taken over. You, you you've you've conquered. The people at the at the ground level, you, you've conquered people at the mind at academic level. I mean, that's heavy duty stuff. Mm -hmm. And I always have uh, on these. I'm not necessarily always, but especially in my pursuit of 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 my beliefs and this this style of 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 heathenry, right? How I've kind of grown into this. I I've, I've said for a long time that I. I love the history side of things. I enjoy learning about things from ancient times and learning about how things were done. I've just never fully jumped over to that side of the fence or, or jumped off the other ship to say, that's the only way I'm going to practice. It has to be historically back because I, I, I don't think that as much of the history as we have, I, I, I don't think that it's 100% accurate or true all of the time yeah sure like there's there's definite points of time in history that you know how uh how bloat was was done you know uh in the heimskringla saga you know when it was done where you know with whom whatever like stuff like that but how much of it by the time it got written down was again for not just religious reasons but for political reasons um for other reasons at the time written down or portrayed to present a certain agenda or, mm -hmm. or, or whatever, right? And it can even happen without any sort of um, agenda or uh, intent for personal gain. It can happen completely innocently. Um, take, for example, uh, let's go with, was it Germanica, uh, Tacitus? Yeah, Germania, yeah. Traveled and traveled and recorded his travels. And so a lot of the people in um, the Norse pagan arena will reference that and they'll reference that because it's a source. Um, this is telling us what this person saw in that time being practiced by these people. And so we've got the one reference to um, runes. We get that a lot what should runes be made of stone bone wood fruit bearing wood and he recorded that he stayed with a family the father of the family took carved runes from a fruit tree and by himself went and cast them to get an answer to a question on something that the family had coming up he recorded that and so now that's what we have meanwhile next door somebody could have had bone runes and next door from them they could have used uh wood runes from a non-fruit bearing tree but he recorded this instance and it was honest it was genuine he had no agenda about it he recorded it he wrote it down and that's what we have to read now so that's what we go on but we stick to it as if that is the only way because it's sourced it's written it's in a book that's great but it's not absolute 
Yeah, I, I agree. And some things, and here's kind of the reason why I agree with that specific example, um, because Tacitus wrote things down that he didn't even see. He was documenting things down that his Roman troops had had experienced. He wasn't even a, an eyewitness to most of these things. He was kind of like a secondary source of, of 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 those times you know so he was like oh well you know uh lucius came back from from patrol and he you know was guarding this one homestead or he was you know whatever and he saw this and he told me about it so let me write it down right so there's there's some of that too it's almost like <clears throat> when we uh when we tell stories or the that old school game telephone where i say one thing and then i say it into the ear of the person next to me and around and around it goes. And by the time it gets back to me, it's a totally different story than way it, than the way it started. And I think history plays off in the same type of, of pattern. There's, whether I saw it there or not, I, I heard a story and I thought, ooh, that's going to be cool, right? Let me, let me write that down. Let me jot that down. And then either because of the language, somebody comes, somebody else comes along and then uh, they read it and they're like, well, that's not a word that I'm, a, that I'm fully familiar with. Um, what could he have meant by that? And so they translate it into their language, and then it becomes a totally different thing now all of a sudden. For instance, right, the the the, the thing you're talking about, the runes, I don't even think that, at least in the modern translations of it, that it even says runes. It says that they would cast lots, and, and those lots were cut from fruit-bearing trees, and on those branches, on those pieces, were carved marks or, or something. I don't even think it specifically says runes. However, we have over time just come to sort of accept the fact that this is probably rune magic we don't know what it was for sure but we've deduced that it could be runes may have not been but things because of the translation we're able to develop our interpretation yeah and there's a huge difference between those two things i know they sound very similar translate and interpret but they are very very different we're going to base our interpretations on the translation itself and speaking of that you just mentioned the language barriers even now today in all the connection that we have with the world and through language and communication we still have language barriers uh, you'll speak with people in foreign countries that will say uh we don't have a word for that or that doesn't translate um, instead we say this and it's a group of words instead of a single thing that we might say or we'll have a phrase that they have a single word for, but they don't really translate. So even now today in all this connection, and we still have those barriers, imagine 500 AD, um, you've only mm -hmm. ever heard Latin. And now all of a sudden you've been charged to go into this place where these everything is different. The culture is different. The communities are different. The dress is different. Everything is different. And you have to record it all. So you've got an old Norse or let's even go old Icelandic uh, speaking person uh, telling a story that has been passed down to them five generations. And each time that story has been passed down orally, it's been changed a little bit, especially if it's passed to father's son. Uh, fathers love to add their own little bits into a story to make it funny or more interesting. Uh, so now you've got this story that's been passed down from five generations or being told in old Icelandic to a Latin monk or scribe who is trying his damnedest because he's got to record this. He's been charged to do it. Um, he asked to bring this home. Um, the history of this people. Yeah, I and mean... then back and it gets edited and it gets retranslated and fixed and well, I don't think they meant this, so I'm going to put this word instead. There's so much room for so many things to be so far from what the actual story was. And now here we are in 2023 with Hollander and um, Oliver and Braze and all these other translators uh, that we're reading from. Well, I've also noticed just how much history changes in, in very recent time for like, we'll just say, you know, <clears throat> at some point uh, within the last hundred years or less, even um, pagans nowadays who have been doing this for a very long time, right? Most of their whole lives that they, they 
uh, before the internet, you know, before knowledge was so readily available and easy to access, you know, you had to spend time at a library, you had to go to a university to get formal teaching, or you had to know somebody who had that knowledge already and, and learn from them, like as an, an apprentice, as it were. Even, even now and today, within, like I say, the last less than 100 years, there's, there's things that people have, that they were doing things a certain way, you know, 40 years ago, because that was the information available at the time, and now have shifted, pivoted, changed even how they've done things because the historical sources that they were reading from back then all of a sudden are like, well, guys, we, we, we got it wrong. Why did you get it wrong? Why wasn't that history? You know, like how do you, how do you mean you got it wrong? <laughs> well, we dug up this one thing and we realized that what we thought back then wasn't right because we found this, this piece of a, of a, of a, you know, a, a comb or a, or a bracteate or, or something that now tells us otherwise. So with 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 history, I feel like it, one of the pitfalls that people can get into, you know, especially with heathenry, right? Because it's 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 people uh, will argue that well, we don't have a lot of stuff written down. There is a lot of shit written down through sagas, through through folk tales. You just gotta look. You gotta you gotta do the homework, right? You can find things, but it changes like the archaeological stuff. Like it changes so many times. So you know, you're gonna be like, well, in 20 years, maybe the stuff that we're doing now something gets unearthed in Denmark or Norway or wherever and they go well guys it's it's different again so the, the pitfall I was trying to say is that is, is that people get too they put too much stock into the history and they and they almost don't want to budge when it comes to anything else other than that have you experienced that yourself with with dealings with people or just seeing that kind of pattern <laughs> I guess so, people want to go all in um in the last decade, there has been a huge influx into the Norse pagan community, and uh, thanks to pop culture, uh, and that's a good and bad thing. A lot of these people are coming over, um, converting from Christianity, and there's a lot of indoctrination to let loose and let go of in coming over. A lot of habits, a lot of mindsets, a lot of ideologies that you should leave at the door, but I understand it's very hard to. You've grown up your whole life with this you've lived this it's what you know it's ingrained in you um, and it comes back to that word absolute so when you're growing up religious be it any of the abrahamic religions especially because they love that book they've all got a book uh, the bible for example is an absolute text in christianity it's absolutely right it's absolutely perfect everything in it is absolutely correct whether it be historical, whether it be a story, a uh, record of someone's life, an event happening, it's absolute. And so it carries over. Now, I'm going to read the poetic or um, any of these other Norse texts, and I feel like I have to apply it here, that it must be absolute. Um, there is no other way that what it says in this book is the absolute truth. Well, this book was originally translated from Christians um, recording these stories from the Norse peoples and then retranslated. And then it's all in Latin. The whole world was Latin for most of that time. And then it's translated from Latin to French and Latin to German and German to English and uh, so on and so on. So yeah. it goes back to like that translation oh, over interpretation. Take it all with a grain of salt. Literature is a great tool. It's a great resource. Um, but you cannot let that page replace your practice, uh, your active practice. And that's going to come from you. You're not going to find it on a page. A page isn't going to tell you how to do it. And if it does, that's someone else telling you how they did it. So you're only copying what they've done and hoping that it works for you. You have to live it. Yeah, fully agree. You know, experience is the those trans thing. Um, even historical. Say a hundred years from now, after I'm dead and gone, all these things have happened in the world, and someone digs up an old diary of mine, and I've written in there, and they can make it out. Um, Odin is rad. 
<laughs> people nowadays don't know what the word rad means but they're going to get that and they're going to be like what in the world is rad maybe i bet they meant to put bad i know what bad is and it's close enough so yeah. this person says odin is bad so this person is definitely not norse pagan um, he doesn't like odin at all we can take that as history because it's written by this person and we have record of it but we've mistranslated, we've misinterpreted, but now it's absolute truth because it's recorded. It's in a book by whoever made that misinterpretation, that mistranslation. It's that simple. Yeah, no. And I've seen stuff like that with, um, with some of the, uh, the, the skaldic poetry and, and poetic Edda uh, poems, Voluspa. For example, I um I had a couple of gentlemen on this podcast uh a while back, and one of the guys is a linguist and has and uh, I don't know fully his credentials, but not only is he a linguist, but he's he's been pagan and heathen, you know, for forty plus years, you know what I mean. So his his history and his of, of practice is 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 pretty extensive, but his studies in the language. Um, not just Old Norse, I'm talking like Old Saxon, um, Proto-Germanic, you know, the languages that Old Norse came from, right? Um, we were talking about, you know, a couple of stanzas in the Voluspa, because the, the, the thing was talking about altars in, in Asgard. Um, and, and somebody was like, you know, wait a minute, what? Like, uh, when you when we look at what, what the purpose of an altar is, you know, like, why would we, there be such a thing in a holy place where the sacred reside, you know what I mean? And come to find out that, you know, we didn't, we didn't say that the Voluspa was wrong in its translation, but what, what he was able to deduce and, and come out through his linguistic knowledge is, is that the, the translation that we're reading from or how those words get translated into the modern text probably don't mean what we think they mean. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, so understanding the language and that's, that's the other thing that a lot of folks that get into this find themselves getting into heavily is, is learning the language, wanting to speak uh, for all intents and purposes, a dead language. Old Norse isn't spoken anymore, at least not, in a, in a population aspect, right? I mean, it's maybe spoken in small circles academically. There's, there's certainly places for it, but you know, it's, it's, we've got close cousins, this, you know what I mean? Like the modern Icelandic language, Norwegian and Swedish, right? They're all the sentence of that old Norse language, but um, yeah, just learning the language can really enhance what you think is absolute, like you say, most, some some folks that get that get into poems from the poetic edit and they think, well, just because it's written this way, that's got to be how it is 100% of the time, all the time. And then we come to find out through experts in the linguistics field, maybe not, you know, it's how it was interpreted at the time, kind of goes back to what you were saying. Well, maybe that, that part of that rune got shaved off over time and it looks like an L, but it should be an A. You know what I mean? And it changes the whole meaning of it. Just that one little thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, what we're reading are from a handful of translators. Um, their work got famous and they might have been good in their time, but like you just said, we've come such a long way in our understanding of languages and their origins and their roots and root words and, and how all this comes about. So it would be interesting to see a more modern interpretation, I think, if somebody could get a hold of um, original text to translate themselves, see how it oh, yeah. matches up with um, Hollander or uh, some of the others. Yeah, yeah, I wonder that too, because um, you know where the translations that we have now over the centuries, how they, like you say, you got different versions from different authors. Uh, what were they all translated from to begin with? Where is that quote unquote original manuscript? You know, is it Snorri? Was there something that he was writing down from, or was it all just his memory of the stories? And then everybody got their hands on Snorri's work and started 
change you know re, you know translating it into their languages and that's where the meaning got lost so was there something even older than snorri that was written down we don't know i don't think i don't think we can definitively say because again the the kind of the track record of of uh people at the time they were largely illiterate and just didn't write things down like that stories were passed down orally traditions were carried out you know from like you said before like descendants to descendants and and they uh they lived it out and they just did it they didn't i guess feel the need to have to write this story down about how thor wins his hammer back uh you know or whatever so yeah um and at that time that's all that was needed mm -hmm. um, people were living in tight-knit communities um, families so all your communication was right there you didn't need to write something down for it to be remembered because uh, you're telling that story in the person that you've told it to is going to remember really a big need for writing because that closeness uh, those communities that dynamic there but as the world in a society sense got bigger and bigger and bigger we said hey some of the stuff is really important and it's getting lost we're going to have to find a way to um, get this down and save it uh, or for other people or to be able to share or when we started crossing um, borders and trade uh, the language mm -hmm. barrier and it's easier to to make a symbol or to write a symbol to get your meaning across them to fight back and forth with words that neither of you understand i can draw a cow and then i can draw two goats and that person's going to understand i want to trade uh, two goats for a cow or the other way around but i don't know their word for cow or goat they don't know mine we're going to argue back and forth and it may get misinterpreted yeah i might be trying to do business but they think i'm being offensive because my frustration in this language barrier and there's a whole nother example yeah and um you made me think of something i saw one time uh of course there's no there's no audio to it because it's so dated um and the way that they would um kind of record some of the earliest like video footage that ever existed here in in north america i think it was i forget who the indigenous chief was but i think it was might have been sitting bowl and and like buffalo bill cody there was they they were basically they were sitting on like the back of a wagon and if it was sitting bowl again i'm just going to use for the sake of argument it's sitting bowl right he's talking obviously you can't hear anything because there was no audio but it was just like rolled footage he's using hand signals and speaking basically through sign and so was cody or whoever it was there next to him right there was language that they could, through gestures and through, you know, body language, communicate things at least enough uh, to to get the the gist of of what they were speaking. Because again, we we saw the same thing over here on on this continent. You know, when the Romans and and whatnot came from the south into Germania and and Tacitus, you know, they're all speaking Latin, and then they come up here to this you know these people who are speaking a totally different language i'm sure something similar like when colonizers came here to this continent and they uh have the indigenous people in the different regions speaking a, a a language that they couldn't understand same sort of same sort of things probably happen you know and gesture is almost like a, a universal communication uh, where languages are very complicated <laughs> they're very specific very unique uh, very different but we've all got gestures that we can make and on that primal level understand and i think too didn't um didn't some of the indigenous people whether by whether by their own free will or, or whether it was forced learn languages that were they that were not native to them like the colonizers like there were plenty of uh of of native tribes who had to speak english and french i think was a big one too in some regions they 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 had they had to speak french because i want to say they had to but again like this is their home this is their arena their like if anybody should learn another language it should be the 
the shitheads that came over here and started messing everything up, you know, like learn our language, damn it. But no, they they end up learning the language of the invaders of the colonizers and and uh like what a what a what a kind of slap to the face. Uh, um, not to defend the colonizers, but it, it would have also been very difficult uh, because as you travel through uh, the colonies at the time, you would have encountered many, many different languages and dialects oh, from yeah. the population. I mean, I guess it's like when people, you know, immigrate here even still to this day, you know what I mean? Like, you got to learn the language of the people uh, that are the populate the, the majority, you know, and I guess for the tribes, you know, when they see people like our skin color everywhere it's like well i guess we we follow suit and learn their ways native languages are surprisingly um, easy to learn um, they don't have a, a broad broad vocabulary um, they have important words for important things and mm -hmm. not a lot of fluff to the language you don't have a whole lot of extra words that you need to add in um, really to get your point across and so that's where some of those hand gestures would come in and those signs as you're talking, um, you're speaking two languages at the same time. You're saying the important thing uh, vocally, but while you're gesturing, and that makes the full sentence. Yeah, like uh, <laughs> you ever watch The Office? Remember Kevin Malone where he, why speak lot word when few word do good? You know, like it's a big fun, but like kind of in that way, you know, We've, we've gotten very, very fancy and yeah. always overcomplicated language. We've added, a, we've added a ton to it and still uh, miscommunicate and misunderstand, even with all the, the thousands and oh, thousands yeah. that we have. Uh, we're still so poor at them that you want to know how many times you want to know how many times I mix up and I know what the two words mean. You want to know how many times I mi I mix up illicit and solicit? Like, oh, I'm gonna, I want to, I'm, I'm trying to elicit a response. No, you're not. You're trying to solicit a response, and I go, Doi, you know, or um, solicit illicit behavior. <laughs> so yeah, or uh, another one is uh, anonymous and unanimous. Like, should the vote be unanimous or? Or, or should they say it unanimously or anonymously? I, I get, I know what they mean. I, I do. I just in the in the delivery, I, I end up messing it up sometimes. So you know, blame happens. Shakespeare. Let's blame it on Shakespeare. Words worse. Yeah. Those jerks. Too many words, guys. Damn it, Bill. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was thinking too. Like you mentioned, like uh, you know the the. Uh, Christians use their Bible as their absolute text of authority, you know, when it comes to life and when it comes to anything, even history you mentioned. And I, uh, I can speak to that too, because I, of course, growing up, you know, the Bible was the central thing that, you know, it, it, it was what we, our lives revolved around to the point that I remember being told as a kid that it's okay to not be smart to not be intelligent because some of the apostles, I think it was John and Peter and whatever the ones, uh, they were ignorant and unlearned. And so it's like, they would use that in their, in, in, in when I was raised in there, like they would use that part in the Bible that says that they, that these guys were ignorant and unlearned men, meaning they couldn't read and they couldn't write that it's okay. But, like to not was, seek higher education be an idiot in your life, like essentially, like don't don't worry about worldly knowledge. It's just going to bog you down. I'm like, wow. To, to hammer home that faith. Yeah, even uh, the Bible itself in that absolute state that people take it at is subject to the same it's been written and rewritten and translated and collected and lost and changed and altered and added to and pieces omitted and um, they're still finding gospels still to this day that, yeah wow that are not included but they are along the same timeline as the works of jesus christ himself 
That's incredible. James version of the Bible. And yeah, I remember, uh, you know, because the, 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 the version of Christianity I was raised in, we only read from the King James Bible, the King James version translation, whatever. And um, I don't know if this is true across other translations, but like in, in the Old Testament portion of that manuscript, that translation of the manuscript, right, uh, where the Israelites are um, freed from slavery in, in Egypt. I remember like the only mention of, uh, of, of, uh, who is it? Um, was it Xerxes, the Pharaoh at the time? Moses. Well, no, I mean the Pharaoh who was, who was the Pharaoh at the time? It was, was it Xerxes? Ramses. Ramses. Sorry. Yeah. Ramses. Uh, his name's not mentioned at all. It's just, and Pharaoh said they're using the title of a king of an of a of a of a divine leader. They're using the title as his name. Like and Pharaoh said, "Yeah, Pharaoh, who? Who's the Pharaoh?" <laughs> they never even mentioned his name. So I grew up in my youth again, believing that seeking higher knowledge, going to school, uh, you know, college, just reading history books, learning about stuff like that was I wouldn't necessarily say forbidden, but it was really frowned upon. I grew up most of my youth thinking that there's just this one guy named Pharaoh <laughs> controlling the Israelites and, and Moses freed them from him. I never knew his name until like later on in my life. I'm like, damn, your, 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 your own book of absolute truths and stuff is, is missing key points of history. And why is that? Why did the, the, the writers who translated the text back in the 1600s 1500s whenever it was that king james authorized that to be done why did that name get omitted was there an agenda was there a reason why did they want to leave out the name ramses for some unknown reason or something who knows but fact is that it was like or or, or was it never mentioned in the original you know or or it mentioned in the manuscripts that those people had at the time to translate from Makes you think, you know, like was Pharaoh's name ever mentioned in those texts? Was was it was he called Ramses? Was he just called Pharaoh because they didn't want his name remembered? Because we know, you know, part of commemorating and part of immortalizing individuals is we speak their names. Their names are their reputations, right? What they've done don't die. And so that there's power in that. And it makes me wonder if the omission of such names was in their time a way to include the story but not give power to the name and, and essentially have that name forgotten and that person forgotten definitely and that's something that um the egyptians at the time practiced um very well uh if a pharaoh uh, went south with the people and uh, got the boot they would go with hammers and chisels and any artwork any murals any anything anywhere depicting any mention whether it be uh, a likeness in a, a picture or photo or not photograph but painting or sculpture and they would deface it mm. and they would scratch the face off they would scratch the name out wow. so it could never be repeated it couldn't be remembered um, and there are tons and tons of examples of this archaeological evidence of this practice um, to literally scratch someone's name out of history um, practiced by the ancient Egyptians. Wow. They were literally scratching people's name out of history and yeah. their faces. Uh, you can't even see the likeness or what they looked like at the time uh, because they would chisel the face off. The, the body is still there, um, the garb, the painting, um, all the motifs and everything around, but they will scratch the face off. Hmm. That's powerful. Now, King James, um, a lot of the people, as you had mentioned, uh, churchgoers love that version, the King James, and in it, it, uh, it talks a lot about homosexuality being an affront to God. It's a, it's an absolute sin. Um, oh yeah, huge inside joke that King James himself, and this is a fact through many texts, um, very much enjoyed keeping the company of men himself oh yeah yeah the irony right 
So that's that's a, that's a fun one. Um, but then you've got like Constantine and uh, those who organized and think about it. You send the Crusades out to get all these treasures from the Holy Land, and they come back with some texts. Who knows? Who knows if it was all? Who knows if it was half? Who knows if they only got a handful? Um, but then this is what you base your holy scripture on or your your absolute text on and then there was a period in england where um, it was popularized for each king to have their own version or their own interpretation of the bible it showed that you were a very christian king uh, to commission your own um, just the same as king james did yeah uh, to follow in those footsteps so now you've got yeah 20. you got a lot of brownie points of the Bible with 20 different interpretations, 20 different translations. And yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, take it with a of salt. Oh yeah. I, uh, it's interesting, like looking at timelines of things. Um, so I guess it was either the late, I was, I think like the mid to late 1500s, maybe early 1600s when the King James, uh, version was, written i don't know how long it took to complete but it was somewhere around that time like and then i think it was somewhere in the same vicinity of time history wise where uh john d and, and them guys for that collaborated and put together the book of enoch i don't know if you've ever dabbled in or, or read any of that but you want to talk about like a, a gap of missing information that feels like it could have been included in the the bible i mean like the the manuscripts like you think it would what be happened with all that you know why did they just decide no 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 no, we're not gonna yeah well yeah it does and then now it makes sense um, why that was left out in the the gospel of mary magdalene and why it was omitted from the the collection that ultimately became the bible that we know now yeah there there are a lot of texts well, and that were purposely left out of that collection that became the bible what i find really interesting is hat is that um you know christianity um still has their uh their, their the old and new testaments and the old testament books that predate the existence of of their christ um what about the the, the judaic text the torah right that aren't even included in the in the christian bible in their old testament mm -hmm. like you took christian like christianity comes from judaism and you know what i mean the book the, the book of the law that jesus speaks about in the gospels is the torah is is, is their old is their old sacred texts it has all of their laws it has their histories of their kings the chronicles of the various wars and land and, and, and conflicts and things their 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 songs are written there their prophets have books written in there you know what i mean but not all of the ones that are part of the judaic sacred text have moved into the the modern christian sacred text so you go well what's really going on here why leave out those parts of their history as it's it were you know entirely and so what Christianity more or less was founded on was that what if fear oh yeah and it was um spearheaded by his disciples those ones that wrote uh, the books on his life and their time with him um, what if this really is the son of God the Jewish people don't believe it but what if it is and we have forsaken the literal son of god we are going to be punished big time we're going to be a big trouble for this if we don't praise and worship him and honor his life so it's that fear of what if um, so better to be safe than sorry we're going to go with christianity believe in jesus um, and that's sort of where that separation occurred man i've heard that so many times throughout my life you know um better safe then sorry you know even if i'm even if it's wrong at least i'm doing the thing just in case it's right and how many of us are really living like that nowadays how many how many folks have accepted that as just the way to go versus 
hearing things that speak through them. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, doing things in practice that are meaningful to us, that we receive messages or or prompts or or things through us. Nothing that you can find written down in necessarily in a history book or in a in a in a story per se, but that is truth nonetheless because we've experienced it where we are experiencing it. and then many people have have just become desensitized to those messages and have come to the point that they they they, they can't hear them anymore they can't connect in that way anymore and they're just doing what they're doing because well who knows what's right but at least I'm safe and not sorry out of that fear just of read what we can read and that's all there is to it because um, it's dangerous to do something that isn't cited or isn't sourced or doesn't have a reference. But if you doubt at all that the text you're reading from the old Norse people have been influenced by the Christianization of Scandinavia, then ask yourself, why is it so difficult to find in text some of the most important things of those people in bloat and symbol and ritual and their faithful practices. You're going to find a hundred stories about who slept with who and had what kid and that kid killed this kid and slept with this person and this person. But the entire plan in the Christianization of Scandinavia was to erase their practice, to erase their spirituality, their faith, to make the conversion go through. So you're not seeing that, um, maintained you're not seeing that recorded you're not seeing any way for it to be written down to be passed on to anyone else it's skipped over entirely save for a few things that we've been able to find here and there yeah um, through archaeological evidence yeah um, yeah they consciously left it out of what they what they uh what they wrote down practice the culture is all there, um, the clothing, they talk about the food that they ate, everything, everything but uh, the practice and the spirituality. Mm. That's what they needed to get rid of for Christianity to move in. So you cannot tell me that uh, the text that we're reading now, although we know they were translated by the monks and the scribes at the time that were Christians coming over to record the, the history of the people and the culture, that those things weren't you know, organized in such a way. Mm -hmm. What why is that thing missing? Yeah, and why has it been, why are those things missing and why do we instead have um, so many uh, examples written in 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 how the israelites were to sacrifice to their deity right because it's very specific uh judaic or christian text it's very specific at that time how the people were to interact with the divine with with god you know what i mean like with their god how the priests were to approach the temple what cleansing rituals were to be done how many weights of this thing that or the other how many doves how many oxen how many pounds or, or whatever the weight shekels uh of, of gold or silver or this or that you know all of these things very very specific and and i just now thought of this this isn't anything that i've put a lot of thought into so i'm just kind of it's word vomit here but what do you think of we're rambling the, the, yeah exactly it's the name of the show like what, you surprised <laughs> but um had to pull what <laughs> what do you think of um the idea that the ritual itself is what matters, not who or what it's done to or for. The modality, the, the methodology, the, the doing of it. Could you apply the same mechanics, the, the, the doing of it, and position it to your sacred powers, whoever, whatever they may be? Like, what do you think of that? Like, there's no real, so like, well, let's just say like the, the, all the rituals and all of the things written down in, in the Judaic text, and it's all to, uh, you know, Yahweh uh, or whatever. And, and, but we omit that part and we just say, well, it's to the gods or it's to 
whoever you choose to venerate. Do you think that it's, that it carries the same or could carry the same kind of per, the weight behind it, the doing of it? I don't, um, but that's coming from a polytheistic standpoint. Um, if I think myself a deity and I pass this information on to the faithful or followers, those um, that recognize me as such, and I say, these are my preferences. Um, I like coffee at seven o'clock in the morning, uh, these certain things. And so they do these certain things as a way to honor or venerate or worship, whatever you want to call it. Uh, those people are not going to be able to take that method or that concoction of ritual to another person or another deity who's going to have different praises or preferences for praise or worship. They're not, they don't even like coffee, let alone to have it at seven o'clock. So um, if you've got all these people coming to make offerings of coffee at a certain time, I'm going to be like, uh, that doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to answer you for that. I don't like, I don't like that. Mm. So I guess it's populism versus monotheism. Uh, is there one God, just many names? Are there many gods? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, again, being a polytheist myself, I mean, I think the gods are sovereign and in that they're um, the Norse gods are the Norse gods, the Germanic gods are the Germanic gods, the Asiatic the uh, Indian, Indo-European gods, you know, the whatever name or names that the divine may carry based off of a culture or a region, I think are what they are and they exist in their, in their way. Uh, I guess well, more or less what I was saying is, you know, the modality of approaching sacred space and cleansing before you do it, just like the Levite priests would do, or burning certain items as as a like incense or resin or, or something to you know ritually cleanse an area and then taking those ritual items and presenting them to an altar like those parts of the the mechanics of it like not necessarily again doing it to the one I god think, but i do think that is um almost like a, a universal type thing yeah and, and paying respect to what you're doing, the the act of making offering or going into a holy place or holy space um, to be clean to go into it. Right. Respect so it. my so my point, I guess, is what I'm trying to reach is that even though the Germanic peoples, Norse peoples, haven't don't have a sacred text of the same degree of of uh of the granularity of it, like they don't have anything written down like this is how the Gothis did it or whatever. Um, can we say that they probably did something very similar to what is documented in Levitical priest text? You know what I mean? Like the way, like the, the most detailed specific stuff, like, can we assume or deduce that even though it's not written down in history, that there, this is probably very similar to the way they did it because we see this modality, right? We, we see this sort of thing being done in different cultures, not just Judaic or Christian Belief There's systems. a ton of references to cross-cultural ritual practice, uh, sacred herbs, burning sacred herbs, and their incense is one of them. You see them do it with the frankincense to this day in a Catholic church. They swing the 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 burner and yep. the smoke, and you see it in India, and you see it here in North America. You see it in South America. Um, so there are a lot of cross-cultural things that I think are just exactly what you're talking about that idea uh, that we share as humanity in uh, being respectful, uh, being clean. Um, there is a small surviving text that makes reference to that itself. And I think it's um, talking about Helgafjell or the holy mountain in Norse uh, mythology that you can't even look in its direction if your face is unclean. You have to take water and clean your face to even be able to look at it otherwise you've done something bad you, you're not deserving uh, to look at it with a dirty face because it's that special mm -hmm. the healing mountain the holy mountain uh, in norse mythology is that special piety so right ritual 
mm-hmm. piety. Rich, and just making yourself presentable. And that's something else that the Norse were really big on. Um, and the things that remain, you see it in the hollow mall. You know, if you're going to go to the thing, if you're going to go to the meeting, dress nice, wear your good clothes. Don't go looking like a scrub. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to be made fun of. You're going to be disrespectful to the assembly that's happening, the company that you're with uh, to go like a skank, you know, take a yeah. bath, put your good clothes on, your clean clothes on and uh, look well, be respectful. Yeah, I uh, I saw something recently and I know we're getting about to close to time. I want to be respectful of your time to wrap it up because we've gone so many different directions and it's all great. But there's one one thing that I saw that I wanted to mention because it does line up with this is is being pious or the piety uh, aspect of, you know, I don't know. I don't know if you've seen this too, but like people, people seem to have just lost the, the context of what holy is and that it definitely applies in, in any religious or, or, or spiritual practice. There are saying there are things and there are beings that are holy and uh, the actions of interacting with them need to be approached knowing that and taking the right steps to be deserving of an audience you know and and to be pious with it and to not just like well i'm in my and you know don't take this the wrong way for anybody that's pretty uh relaxed with this but i mean your t-shirt blue jeans and work boots coming into bloat you can do better you can do something better you can put on your nicer shoes you can do uh something different you don't have to necessarily be in like full period clothing or ritual garb but you can put an effort in and and actually show that you care and and you know what you're about to be in the presence of you know i think um i agree 100 percent. as a society in the last 10 20 years the last five especially we've become very nonchalant people Uh, too cool too cool for school Mm. because people shit on other people like oh you believe in that oh well yeah i do but now i feel bad about it so i'm not going to make such an effort because i know i'm being made fun of i'm being mocked Mm -hmm. that's how a lot of people will go i don't give a shit you can make fun of me all you want to i'm still going to do what i do but as a people as a society we've become um, less faithful in our practices and our beliefs we've let a lot go Uh, we don't practice with the same reverence anymore and it's very nonchalant if we take it seriously at all and so of course you're not going to get what you're looking for it's not going to be fulfilling you're you're prophesying your own destiny by taking this route Um, you show up half dressed not well not taking it serious not being respectful do you really think um your offering is going to be appreciated mm-hmm. do you really think it's going to be accepted do you think favor is going to be given to you when you're just half-assing it probably not and so you don't get what you were looking for and therefore it's impacted even more okay it didn't happen the thing i needed didn't come through even though i made this offering i made this what i thought would be exchange so now i definitely don't believe mm. well you did it to yourself mm. Yeah, I think it's a combination of like what you were saying, where people get mocked or made fun of. And so for, 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 for people who maybe put more stock into the opinions of others, get discouraged and, and lose sight of what they've become initially. So that's the word that was evading me. I'm discouraged. So thank you for that. <laughs> people get discouraged. Yeah. I've seen that happen. And um, because I get asked, you probably do too, a lot of times from different folks of, you know, where do I reconnect? How do I, how do I reconnect? You know, I feel like I've lost the fire or I've, I just don't feel like doing it anymore. Or um, they, again, they, they lose that. And I have to wonder if, if so much of modern society and, and the way we interact with people has been a high contributor to the reason why folks get discouraged or they lose that interest and they find the next thing that's stimulating and they don't stick with that thing that they found interesting or that they found wholesome to begin with because of allowing 
outside influences to kind of muddy the waters. And uh, it's another reason why I also, you know, really don't want people that, um, you know, go to ritual or, or, or enter into that space to be too heavily intoxicated to the point that they don't know what's going on or they're unpresentable uh, for that for that thing that's that's being done uh, it's an affront it's an affront no longer present you know it's disrespectful it's an affront to the gods and to the sacred powers that are around us both divine and, and localized spirits that have that we are trying to invite and and welcome into that space it'd be like you know hey guys come on over i'm having a having a dinner uh want you guys to come over and then when you do i'm you know nine sheets to the wind and can't stand up straight like that's bad it's just a bad experience overall, you know, or, or if guests come over and they're like nine sheets to the wind, you know, and I'm like, man, couldn't you have just waited a bit? Couldn't you have just held off, calm down with that, you know, same type of thing. You didn't solicit this advice, but I would like to offer a piece of advice for anybody that's watching that may have ever felt discouraged or you know, been the target of that uh, mocking or, anything in your practice buckle up because it's not going anywhere mm. i don't know if i should just tell you to have tougher skin or to just let it roll off your shoulder but it's not going anywhere it's been around for a long time um this idea this thing that's happening came out of humor a form of humor called ridicule it was uh, popularized in France and where it's cool to make fun of other people. You become more popular by mocking and making fun of others. So you're going to face that. It's still around today. It's still practiced. People still believe that they are more cool by making fun of other people, whether it's legitimately something to make fun of or be mocked or not. They do it thinking they get those popularity points. That's not going anywhere. So with that knowledge, you can make your adjustments, knowing that they probably aren't really making fun of you. They just feel the need to do it to feel better about themselves, feel more popular or more right, whatever. Let it roll off your shoulder. If you're doing you, do you. You're not doing them, so don't let them do you. Damn right. <laughs> now, on illicit. Yeah, I was I was waiting for it. I'm like, he's gonna throw it in here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, ridicule flight flighting, right? Like read Locusena. Um that was a thing for D Germanic people too. I mean, flighting was a it was a form of of bonding, it was a form of entertainment. There was there was a lot of it, you know, about there to 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 kind of you know roast your 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 kinsmen or or roast other people and and uh so but like you say you know a lot of it is they don't know you um they don't have real dealings with you so don't take it don't take it to heart you know um I, i'm the type of person who listens to a lot of what people say and and almost force of uh to find a way of, of where it applies but so much of what I listen to or what I end up having to hear. I don't say listen to it, but what I have to hear is it's not important. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything really in the long run. Somebody's opinion that they responses ever is what on earth have I done to make you think I value your opinion of me in this <laughs> ridicule or mockery? <laughs> If I have done something to give you the impression that I value your opinion, I apologize because I do not. <laughs> nice. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but you're not entitled to people valuing it. It's true. Also true, you know. So you're always going to face people's opinion, but it's your decision whether you give that weight or not. Yep. And as we've kind of come to realize today with, regards to those that want to give you uh, a scolding or ridicule because of, well, it's not historical. Guess what? Maybe the historical stuff isn't all that it's cracked up to be anyway. And so what is it? Was it where, where, really, where, where does it all land ultimately? You know, are you 
Have you been fulfilled and enriched by what you're doing? Well, then why in the hell are you letting some other guy on the cross the boat? you know, across town, across the city, across the country, across the world, try to guilt you into thinking differently because it's not historical or uh, any such thing. That happens our, a lot too. Our history is not the history that we think. It's the history that was written by those who wrote it however they wanted. And we do have history in things like archaeology, Yep. Um, the dig sites, the rune stones, there's physical evidence that we can rely on and count on and fold into our practice. And we can take those sources. And I'm not saying to discredit every text. I'm yeah. saying to take it with a grain of salt. Remember what you're reading. Remember how many times it's been translated, retranslated, reinterpreted, words not matching up, not lining up the language barriers. Think about where this text came from. It's good. It's good to have a tool. It's good to read. It's good to educate yourself, but dig and dig some more. Yeah. And, and reach a conclusion or, or come to a conclusion yourself uh, that is practical and purpose driven for yourself, I think is, a, is another key thing to take away, you know, learn all the things you want to about history. And uh, if that's your flavor and, and that's what really whets your appetite, we're not saying that you're misled by doing so. Just like you say, Papa, you know, be aware of what you're reading and know its place. And don't quench that spirit within us to prevent us from living in things out and, and writing our own pieces of history and becoming those that are written in sagas for of our time, you know, if you want to look at it that way. Um, but it's what it's what you're gonna feel. And with those around you, should you have those people that align with those feelings, want to nurture and share in the same types of things. So that's that's really where the magic happens. That's really where the the power exists, is getting out of the books and getting into the into the grass, into the into the earth, putting knowledge to use, going to the workshops and learning how to use the tools that have been made. The only page you're going to find your life or practice on is a page that you write yourself. If you're reading it, you're reading someone else's experience. Again, that can be a great tool, but that's their experience. That's not your own. You have to write your own. Make your own history. At the top of Stone Mountain here on one of my hikes and I feel something, if I feel compelled to make offering to sit in silence there and pay reverence you're not going to find that in any of the norse sagas you're not going to find me doing that so it's not historical but it's right i feel it i know it's right it's part of my practice so yes i'm up there doing it. is it historical no does that matter nope nope exactly right I yeah i bet practice I couldn't agree more with you, brother. I, uh, I definitely align with you on that. And I hope the people listening and watching today um, can find some use for it too. Um, it's always an, always a great experience just getting to, to ramble with you about stuff. And, you know, we, 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 I, I got told the other day about the, the pattern that this podcast kind of goes in and it's like a, a circle, you know, it goes, random in ways but we always end up coming back to the path and then bring it home you can go off. yeah yeah exactly the cycle and uh i thought that was a great analogy you know and that's life you're gonna you're gonna go along this path of life and you're gonna find different roads to travel you're gonna find different paths to explore and then then you're eventually going to get back on the main road and continue on down the line for however long and then get off that exit. And so in, in like fashion, we come up with some things and we learn some things together on this podcast. And I think that's great. I'm glad that we have that opportunity. Absolutely. Um, but we're going to go ahead and wrap this up for the people. Is there any other parting words or any other things that you wanted to plug or, or share with everybody before we wrap this up? Oh, I, I think I'm good other than maybe to, to share that bit 
um, the other day that I shared on social media, Lagos is life. Um, I literally take it that way. And it's the water, of course, but it's cycle. And you may think differently on Lagos with this interpretation, but um, it's not just the stream. It's not just the river, but Lagos is your path and life path all the way around um, from the sea. That's before we're born or after we die, that great outside the universe, we look at it as sometimes the cosmos, the, the black night sky and the stars. You know, that water evaporates from the sea into the clouds. It's carried over land and comes down as rain. And then it makes its way through the mountains of streams to rivers and rivers to the deltas and deltas back out to the ocean. So Lagos is life. It's the full life cycle full current of life i know that was a little bit random as like a last thing to leave people with but yeah. we're on random heathen rambling Let's keep it keep it in kind yeah exactly man i uh having experienced you know water in its in its various forms myself i uh i love the analogy it is one life. of the play on is life when i posted that i was sharing a part of my life and uh, my family my children's life so that's my life's extension, my children, and enjoying the water, the stream here in the mountains, and, and that it came from the sea at one point. It's here in the mountains, and we'll go back to the sea just the same as we all will. A lot of great minds have shared in that same sentiment, you know. Bruce Lee even said, be water, mm -hmm. you know. So a warrior himself, a, full, a, a warrior poet maybe, bit of a philosopher in ways but uh, yeah it's a common common sentiment shared um and i thank you for reiterating and sharing that again here for for the listeners and the watchers today so um that that does me on again very appreciated always enjoy spending time with you and our conversations yes man it's a it's a it's a great honor as always so thank you so much and thank you everyone that's uh tuning in today and watching this or listening to this hope that it's uh rung a bell for you or, or touched a, a nerve or spoken to you in some way and if you do feel so inclined and you want to show your support for this uh podcast or in the channel you know click down in the description area find that link tree link or the show notes wherever you find it um that link tree link is going to be your one-stop destination to find all the ways that you can uh support this podcast the broadcast the channel as a whole and um yeah, definitely check out um, all of Papa's stuff with Fjallvatir. Uh, it's going to be linked in the show notes and description as well. Um, so that does conclude today's episode. If you like it, give it a thumbs up, share it around, comment, engage with the platform to appease the algorithm gods. Uh, so until we see each other again and talk, may the gods continue to notice all of you. And may your ancestors smile upon you.